To everyone, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And to Sister Watson, howdy. <laughs> it's what I tell her every day. I tell her howdy, or every time we come in here. I'm, you all know that I, I, I love the house of God. This is, you, this is where I, I feel at peace, and I feel love and, and the joy, and this is what I need. You, you know, not every day we come in here strong and, and, and filled with God's Spirit. Sometimes it's like a gas tank. We have to get refilled All right. because we come in here empty. So I, I come with you today with a burden. This was just for months just eating at me and eating at me. And I called Brother Thomas, and I apologize him today, to him today in case when I talked to him I was disrespectful or a little bit pushy. Um, because I didn't know how we're supposed to present ourselves to the pastor to say, look, God's given me a strong burden and I can't do anything with it. I mean, what, what do you say about that? I know if I was the pastor, I'd be like, you need to sit down and wait your turn. But since God has allowed it and, and now I get to share a quick burden, we're going to go through this very quickly. So if you'll please so just turn your Bibles with me. First, I, I want you to keep your fingers because these two portions of Scripture, we're going to stay there throughout this whole 20-something minutes. So just keep your fingers there because we're going to be flipping back and forth, back and forth. So first, let's go to Judges chapter 16. We're going to read verse 21, and then we're going to read verse 30. Judges chapter 16. Once you have your finger there, just kind of hold it. Don't let it move. And then we're going to the book of Acts chapter 9. We're going to read verses 8 and 9. Judges 16, Acts chapter 9. Once you have your two fingers there, Go back to the book of Judges, and let's start with verse 21. But the, the, but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. For those of you that was here Sunday night, you actually heard part of this scripture from Brother Thomas. Now skip down, or skip down to verse 30. And Samson said... Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slain, which he slew at his death, was more than they which he slew in his life. All right. Now take that finger and move it over. Keep that finger there on Judges. Move it over to the book of Acts chapter 9. We're going to verses 8 and 9. And Saul arose and Saul, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat or drink. Now, at this point, it would be really easy to talk about Samson, to talk about how he liked to tie foxtails together, to talk about how he liked to uh, mess around with the wrong women, to talk about how he done all the things that he did. And at this point, it would be easy to talk about Saul on how he was pretty much hired by the, the priest to rat out the Christians and to basically to say, I'll find them and I'll bring them in like a bounty hunter. And talk about how he was there during Stephen's stoning. But we're not going to talk about that. Instead, we're going to focus on one simple principle. These two men had to be blind in order to see their true purpose. All right. These two men at, at different points of their lives, Samson at the end of his life, and Saul, or later Paul, that was at the beginning of his spiritual life, they had to encounter something that, that transformed them, that moved them, that shook them. So just for a few moments, I want to preach on 
make me blind so I can see. So if you just place down your Bibles, and I want everyone just to lift their hands, and I want you just to pray. Lord God, we come before you, Lord. We just, we pray that you be with us and help us, God. Anoint my tongue, anoint my mouth. Your word is already anointed, God. Anoint my eyes. Help us to understand, help us to learn, help us to grow, God. And allow me to, to share this burden, this, this feeling that I've had for months, God. And let it soak into somebody. If it changes anybody, God, let it change me. For I'm the least out of all these, but yet I'm here to say this and to spread your word, Lord. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. All right, everybody can sit down. Remember to keep your fingers there. You got a bookmark? As a church, we are going to have to lose our carnal vision or our physical vision in order to see our spiritual awakening. Now let me say that again just so, to make sure that everybody can understand. I'm not asking for everybody to go physically blind. But what I am saying, you're going to have to stop looking with your eyes and start looking in the Spirit because that's exactly what God wants us to do. When we recap the stories very quickly, and I'm not going to linger on this very long, but Samson was one of the judges. He was a Nazarite by birth, which means he had long hair, his uncut hair. He never touched any wine or strong drink. And he had a strength, a power in him that no man could understand. He wasn't a big, like, muscle-bound, strong man because they often said, where does his strength come from? If you saw that he looked like Hercules or, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, you would understand where his strength come from. But they w did not know where his strength come from. Even Delilah propositioned him several times asking, what is the source of your strength? So he was probably just an average, ordinary looking guy. But he used his strength, his power, to play around. And it was a dangerous thing, and eventually it cost him his life when he gave his whole heart to Delilah, which was a Philistine woman, which was the enemies of God. And to make a long story short, they captured him, made him grind in the prison house, made sport of him, laughed at him, mocked him, poked out his eyes, and made him stand there in front of everybody to be made fun of. And then we see Paul... As, or Saul, as he was standing there when the first martyr, Stephen, was stoned to death because he was a Christian, because he followed Jesus. And we look how he held the clothes, and he, he told the priest, said, look, if I find out and rat out these Christians, I'm going to bring them to you, almost like a bounty hunter. But he had a very... Ex explicit special vision that happened on the way to Damascus when a light shined down from heaven it basically just knocked him down on his knees and he heard a voice and he answered the voice and it caused him to go blind which was the death of Saul but it was the beginning the new birth of Paul so when we look at these two men that went blind we have to understand what is God trying to say to us? What, are, what is he wanting us to understand about blindness? Well, if you hang around a blind person long enough, whether it be at a blind school, a blind camp, or just a blind family member, and you watch them, you'll understand that there are some things that they have to do to survive. There are, I have four principles here. First principle is, is that the blind have to be willing to bow or to yield to the person helping them. All right. They're at their whim. They're at their will. Yes, they have a say-so in it, but basically they're, they have to yield to the person that's leading them. They have to trust in that. So when we look at Judges 16 and then we go into verse 30 as we just 
was talking about, and Samson said, let me die with the... Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself. He bowed himself. He yielded to what God had and planned. And then when we go to Saul's situation in Acts 9 and 4, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice. So he fell to the earth before he heard the voice. Right. See, Saul was, when he saw the light and he knew something was going to happen, he was expecting Jehovah to answer. That's the only God he knew of. He was expecting Jehovah. So when he said, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus answered. Don't you find it a little coincidental that he was looking for Jehovah and Jesus answered? All right. But Saul bowed himself. He fell to the earth. As a church, we are going to have to yield ourselves to God. There is no more, and I, I've done this on a 10 minutes of fire once, God is not impressed with your Independence Day. You have to be dependent. None of us are above doing our own thing. We are a dependent people upon God. And once we have God, we can do anything. All right. So, the first thing that a blind person has to do is they have to yield to the person leading them. And we have to yield to God. Because if we don't, we're going to be led astray. And then we're calling out. And he's going to be coming after the one, leaving the 99 for a short time and coming after the one. The second thing that a blind person has to encounter and our first two ministers pretty much covered part of this. A blind person has to be willing to grab the hand of the person leading them. Because that's a sure sign that this is the direction we're going. If you grab a hold of their shirt collar, you might lose their, a grip. If you try to follow their voice, it might be a little bit off. But if you grab their hand like a knitted, tight grip. You won't let go. All right. God won't let go. You won't let go. The blind person's not going to let go because they know once they let go, they got to find that hand again. So when we look at our scriptures, Judges 16 and then at verse uh, 26, and Samson said unto the lad, lad that held him by the hand, a child led Samson into the arena where all the Philistine lords were. A child. I've never understood why a child was there amongst all that evil, but evil is as evil does. We look at Saul's situation in Acts 9 and 8. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, and they led him by the hand. And brought him to Damascus. See, I like that part that says, and his eyes were opened and he saw no man. Now, in the NLT, it actually says, when his eyes were opened, he was blinded and he didn't see anybody and no man. But when I look at that and I really just think about it, I like to think inside my head, when his eyes were opened. All right. I don't like to think his physical eyes were open and all he seen was blindness. We're talking about the transformation between Saul and Paul. His eyes were opened. That's how I want to be. I want my eyes to be opened. So as a church, we have to be willing to let God lead us by the hand. All right. Brother Green's already said it. I can't do anything without him holding my hand. Brother Watson said that we have to be led and guided by God. Well, unless I got a firm grip on his hand, I could be lost. I can't let go of his hand. I'm blind. I can't let go of his hand. I have to hold on to it, or else if I let go, the darkness is overwhelming. But his hand automatically brings the light. Even though I might be physically blind, knowing that he's leading me, 
I'll be led into the light. So as a church, we got to be led by the hand. Whether our pastor tells us to do something, he's guiding us by his hand. He's saying, this is what God wants you to do. Whether it's shaking hands with our brothers and sisters, and even I'm guilty of not shaking hands with everybody. It's not that I don't want to. It's just sometimes time and circumstance, and you just don't get to see everybody. But I should never be ashamed to shake anyone's hand that's in this church. Everybody is worthy of a handshake because that's our way of saying we're together. We have unity. I've always found it amazing in the past when I first come into the apostolic church why everybody says praise the Lord. Why everybody shakes hands and hugs. I never understood that until we did a children's crusade in Michigan and we taught them how to do puppets and how to do children's ministry. And when we went up there, as soon as we walked in the door, it was a praise the Lord and shake, you know, shook our hand and hugged us. Wow, they do it up here too. Did somebody get a memo? Did they send an email? It's the unity in the brotherhood. It's the unity of the church. That's not saying, hey, you need to praise the Lord. That's saying, I'm a member of this club. We have jackets. We have the armor of God. So as we look, we see that the blind people have to go through a lot of different situations than normal people go through. The third thing, the blind people, they have to have clear, precise communication with the person guiding them. Because if I'm holding their hand and they say we're going left and all of a sudden they swing right, I'm going off balance. Or if they say there's a step and you're all of a sudden trying to step, there's no step. There has to be clear Precise communication. So as we look at our scriptures again, Judges 16 and 28. See, I never knew all of them things were in there in just some little scriptures. But as you break it down and you evaluate, Samson and Saul had to go through almost the same things at different times. And Samson, let's see, and Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. He knew he was going to die. O oh God, that I, may, that I may once avenge the Philistines for my two eyes. Even at the end, he knew how to pray. Even all those times of playing around with God's spirit, with God's power, he still knew how to communicate. And God answered his prayer. Even though God may not have actually spoke a word, he answered his prayer because his hair grew back. He grabbed hold of the pillars, and he either pulled them, pushed them, they came down, and everybody came down with them. There was clear, precise communication. When we look at Acts 9 and 5, talking about Saul, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? He was looking for Jehovah, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard to kick against, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Clear, precise communication. If you're going to hold his hand, you better talk to him. Because you don't know what direction he wants you to go. And you don't know what direction he's going to go. Because if you've lived in darkness for a long time, you're not, not, you're not going to know how to survive in the light. As a church, as a body, we are going to have to have communication with God. It's prayer, but it's also more than that. It's an intimacy. It's a, I know him. I just don't see him on Sunday and I see him on Wednesday and I hope he answers a few prayers through the week. I know him. All right. It's precise. It's concrete. It's communication with God and you. The almighty God in all the universe looking down at 
six, seven billion souls all crying for different things. But he takes the time out for you to say, what can I do for you, my child? And one day you'll wake up and realize, God, I don't need anything. What can I do for you today? That's communication. When it's a two-way street. So the blind have to communicate with the person that's leading them. The fourth and last thing, and I don't know how much time. Okay. The fourth and last thing, a blind person has to rely on their other senses when their eyesight's gone. And trust me, if you've been around a blind person long enough, you'll find out they have either outstanding hearing or a strong sense of touch or a strong sense of direction. The other senses pick up where the eye is left off. That's what a blind person, you see them sometimes, you hear about them, they get to do things that are remarkable. Things that you just can't believe. Say, how do they do that? Well, of course it is God, but their senses pick up where their eyes left off. So when we look at our scriptures, Judges 16 and 29, and Samson took hold of the two, the, the, the two middle pillars. He grabbed a hold of them. He knew what he was going to grab a hold of. He knew precisely where to push or where to pull. He used his other senses to pick up that quickly. We look at Acts 9 and 8. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, and they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. His, his senses picked up to, knew, to know that the men with him was going to guide him. He knew where he needed to go. He heard Jesus' voice. He knew what direction to go with the, being with the men. His other senses kicked in. As a church, if we lose our carnal vision, and I don't mean just like worldly sin things, I mean a physical vision without losing your 2020. If you'll just close your eyes and you'll listen and you watch with your heart, you'll see things that you've never seen before with your natural eyes. So God gets a hold of us when we may not see. He'll use those other senses, the communication through our ears, the touch with our hands, the smell of danger, and just like a sixth sense that you hear sometimes people have. So these things a blind person has to deal with. Now, As these four things that blind people have to deal with, if you look at it in the church, if you look at it in this body that's here, this church has been known throughout our whole section. We are famous, in a, in a sense, we are famous for unity. Because other churches look at us and they think, how can a pastor or how can the leaders of the church keep these people to look the way they look, act the way they act, and do what they do? I'm not saying other churches in our section don't have unity. That's not what I'm saying. But if you ask any church in our section what they know about our church, that church has unity. But see, the devil has came in, in the past, just in the past little bit, and he has stolen some of that unity. I don't know if anybody's aware of this. I don't know if anybody has any clue what I'm talking about. But that unity has disappeared. Some of it's my fault. Some of it's your fault. Some, some of it's the devil's fault. But we're not going to blame the devil because we're going to take it back. Right. We're going to use the loss of of our natural eyes to pick up what we've lost. 
So as I explain, I want everybody to stand with me, please. In 1970, a young man named Michael and a young woman, very beautiful woman named Gail, got married. Despite opposition of their family and church, they got married anyway. 1971, she became pregnant with her first child. 1972, she gave birth to her child, and it was a healthy baby boy. Everything seemed fine. Everything seemed normal. 1973 came along, and she realized that she was extremely jealous of the way this child was being treated and the way everybody was paying attention to this new baby and not paying attention to her because she was so used to having that attention. Her jealousy came so strong that one day, while it was just her and the child, she picked that baby up to try to get him to stop crying, and it never worked. She picked him up, and she slung him against the bathroom wall. When the child became unconscious, laying there, lifeless, she ran. She left. The husband, Michael, came home, heard no voices, heard no commotion, but found the baby boy lying in his crib as if nothing would happen. He thought he was asleep, but as he looked closer at his head, he noticed that there was damage, that there was something going on. So he quickly rushed to the hospital, and they sent him to one of the local trauma centers. It was basically the only trauma center back then. When they become or when they began to evaluate this child and look at him closer, they realized that there was severe head trauma because of the abuse. They realized that something had happened. So the baby laid in a coma for three days. There wasn't much they could do from that point in time. But after the child finally woke up, they done a series of tests and they realized the child was blind. Not completely blind, but mostly blind. As this child grew up, the struggles and the challenges of trying to be led in the right direction, trying to find the right hand to lead him in the right direction, to try to find that communication that happiness, that joy, because nothing seemed to make this child happy because he felt like he was robbed of everything. The child, the boy, did not know how to bow before anything. He wanted to be independent. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a very trying time. It took a long time for this child to realize that God wanted him to be blind so that he could see. I know that's a strange thing to understand. But if you can look at me today and you look at me, I can tell you that God made me blind so that I might see. I may not see as well as others, I may not be able to get to do the things that others get to do. I was never picked for sports. I was never picked to be popular. But one day, God found somebody to send to me to show me, and her and her pastor led me by the hand and showed me where I could bow and showed me the communication that I needed to have and showed me that if I use my other senses, a spiritual sense that I knew I never had, that everything was going to be okay. So if this is okay, Brother Thomas, I would like everyone to come up front and stand. I want our youth ladies to be together, and I want our youth gentlemen to be together, and I want the women to be mainly on this side and the men to be on this side. 
And I want to speak one last thing, so if you'll please come up. I know it's a little awkward. Why am I saying all these things to you? Well, it's partially a testimony. It's partially something to let you know that you don't have to look with your natural eyes anymore. Because we've been looking with our natural eyes and we've been seeing things and it's caused a little bit of uncomfortableness among us. This is still a good church and de the devil has not robbed everything from us. But there are some things we're going to have to get back. Our unity has been shaken. Partially because we've lost a lot of good people into the ministry. I miss the Reeves. I miss the Cars. I miss the Markhams. I miss the Byers. And I'm going to miss the Brindleys. And the other, all the other ones that left. But it's for a good reason. But now it's time for us to grow. And we are going to grow this year. I guarantee it. I've, I put my life on it. We are going to grow like we've never grown before. But until we grow, there's some things we're going to have to get back. So if everybody would just close your eyes just for a minute. Shut off your natural, natural vision. I want you to picture all the lights being out in this room. And you have no idea where the exit door is. You're going to have to trust someone to lead you out of here. You're going to have to yield to this person and trust them. You are going to have to listen to their communication and direction. And you're going to have to grab them by the hand. And you're going to have to use your other senses to make sure you don't trip to make sure you don't stumble, to make sure you don't fall. Because without spiritual vision, these things are sure to happen. So this isn't exactly a charge, but I want to challenge everybody that's listening to the sound of my voice. Please understand me. I'm in no position to ask to preach this long. I am in no position to ask, let me share my burden. Because I'm a servant. And I'm here to do whatever I can for the smallest child or to the most seasoned saint. But I am here to tell you, as a naturally blind man, since I was 11 months old because of the hand of my mother. There's more than your natural sight. There's more than what you see. And I don't mean what you just see here. But I mean what you see when you see people leave. When you see people not doing what they're supposed to do. When you see people fellowshipping with other people, but they're not fellowshipping with you. These things you need not look upon. But let's close our eyes. Let's start fresh. Pretend that the person next to you, you have never met. But you know that they are a sister or a brother in the Lord. Everybody is as fresh as Jeremiah as far as innocence. Jeremiah's probably done wrong in the past, just as I've done wrong in the past. But when God looks at him, he sees innocence. Right. He sees faith. And whatever he has his mindset on, that's unity. And that's what we need to do. So as we pray one last time, everyone, please keep your eyes closed. Don't look at anyone. Try not to guess who's beside of you if you haven't already noticed. Let's start fresh with the people that's around us, our brothers, our sisters, even the ones that aren't here.
the ones that have been coming and going but are just a little bit cold in the Lord. Let's forget all their mistakes. Let's forget all their trials. Grab them by the hand. Lead them in here. Say, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've been through. I'm shutting off my natural eyes and I'm leading you by the hand. And for the ones that are in here that have maybe a little bit of a hurt feeling towards another one that's in here, and I can't say much on that because I've been hurt, not in this church, but I've been hurt by others, others in positions, and I've probably hurt other people, and I hope that I haven't hurt anyone here. If I have, then I pray that you and God forgive me because that was never anything I wanted to do. But let's start fresh. Let's build that unity again. The phone calls to one another, the text to one another. Just to let each other, even sending just a simple greeting card, just to say hello, just to cheer them up. Cook supper, invite them over. Whatever God lays on your heart with your natural eyes closed. With Saul, his eyes were open, but he saw no man. Our spiritual eyes are open, and we shouldn't see any individual here. A we should see a group. So as I close, and I know I've already been over, but as we close, please take these words to heart. It has kept me awake for nights because I would do anything in the world for any one of you. Call in the middle of the night, help somebody move, hopefully not far. And that's somebody's phone. I think it's mine. It was supposed to be in the car. Okay, devil. We're taking back what you've stole from us. That's the laughing chipmunk. Sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. But let's be unified. And let's let each and every single person in this church know that we love one another. Because we're going to need to know that when we grow and we won't get to see them except from across in the church. <laughs> 